الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ان شاء الله تعالى we're continuing ان شاء الله we'll finish chapter 1 um, tonight ان شاء الله تعالى I believe we're on section 7 there's 10 sections in chapter 1 and then we'll move on, inshallah. So, last time we talked about section 7 concerning Allah's praise of him and his numerous excellent qualities. So, Qadi Ayyad here, he quotes, as we said, Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 81. This is called the prophetic covenant. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took a covenant from all of the prophets, as we said. And the gist of the covenant uh, according to the commentators that are quoted here by Qadi Iyad, is that the covenant stipulated that if any prophet met the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he must believe in the Prophet وسلم, and help the Prophet's mission. It is said that the pact or the covenant, it's called a mithaq, entailed telling, uh, telling their people about him as well. So every prophet describe the Prophet Sallallahu to their people. So he says here, Allah's words, جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ as we said last time, is in fact addressed to the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book contemporary with the Prophet Sallallahu And then we also said, the next ayah, فَمَنْ تَوَلَّ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ So, whoever turns away after this, Indeed, they are sinners or iniquitous. So, Imam al-Qurtubi and Imam al-Razi state uh, quite unequivocally then that the ayah here can not only be addressed to the prophets, but to their umam, their people. Because a prophet would never turn away and become a fasiq should the Prophet ﷺ come during his time. It's impossible for a prophet to do that. Because the prophets have isma, they have a divine perfection or infallibility, divine with a lowercase d, divine meaning that, or divine meaning that the, the source of their isma is, the, is God, the deity. So they're free from, from, uh, um, from consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this must also refer to their followers turning away from the Prophet sallallahu and becoming iniquitous. So that's, we mentioned that last time. So that's called the Mithaq al nabiin There's another Mithaq we mentioned last time too, mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 172, the primordial covenant, Mithaq al-Ast, right? This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant from all human beings before he created their, their physical bodies. The ulama say that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questioned our arwah, our souls, Alas to be Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we all bore witness, Bala Shahidna, yes, we bear witness. Okay, so that was just sort of review from last time. So Ali ibn Abi Talib he says, Allah, did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send any prophet from the time of Adam onwards without making a pact or a covenant with him about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So this goes back to the previous ayah, Ali Imran, verse 81, Mithaq al nabiyin If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa were sent while that Prophet was alive, then he would have to believe in him and help him. So we mentioned that. He had to make a, uh, he had to make a contract to that effect against his own people. As-Suddi and uh, Qatada said something similar about some other ayat which refer to the excellence of the Prophet Islam in more than one way. Imam, Imam al-Razi also mentions here that this covenant really uh, pertains to any prophet who fulfills the criteria. For example, Yahya is a Nabi, he's a prophet, uh, but when Isa السلام, who's a Rasul, uh, appeared, uh, Yahya السلام, believed in Isa السلام, and helped the mission of Isa السلام. Because Isa السلام, outranks Yahya السلام. Isa السلام, is from the greatest of the five prophets. He's a Rasul, which means that 
He's given a revelation and he's commanded to the people to take the revelation to the people while, while uh, Yahya salam is a Nabi. And of course, Allah says, Musaddiqan bi kalimatin min Allah, that, that Yahya salam will confirm the word of God, meaning Isa alayhi salam. Now, Qadi Iyad here, he quotes another verse. This is Surah Al Ahzab, verse 7, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa id akhazna mina nibiyin mithaqahum, wa minka, wa min Nuh, wa Ibrahim, wa Musa, wa Isa bin Maryam. So here we have yet another covenant. This is an additional covenant taken from these five messengers. These messengers are called the Ulul Azam min al-Rusul. These are the five most exalted human beings to ever walk the planet Earth. Imam al-Qurtubi says they are the great law-giving messengers, the Rusul of the Shara'i. Right? So you have the Mithaqu Alast, which is all of humanity. You can think of it as a huge sort of ring, and then within that ring, concentric circle, the Mithaq of the Nabiyin, 124,000 prophets, although that number is disputed according to the hadith. And then at the center, the, the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with the Rusul, the Ulul Azam min al-Rusul, the five prophets. Now, Qadi Iyad here, the point of quoting this verse is to point out the order of the prophets mentioned. So just to read the verse again, إِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النِّبِيِّينَ and behold, or remember, we took a covenant from the prophets. Mithaqahum wa minka, and from you. So the ka, the kaful khitab here, is a direct reference to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa wa min Nuh wa Ibrahim wa Musa wa Isa ibn Maryam. Notice the other four prophets are in chronological order. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned first. That's what he wants to point out here. So just some commentary on that. Qadi Iyad, he mentions that Umar ibn al-Khattab was lamenting the death of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, my father and mother be your ransom, O messenger of God. It has come down that, uh, that part of your excellence with Allah is that he sent you as the last of the prophets while mentioning you among the first of them. And then he quotes the ayah, when we made a pact with the prophets in, from you and from Noah, Nuh salam. My mother and father be your ransom, O Messenger of Allah. It has come down the part of your excellence with him is that the people of the fire will wish they had obeyed you uh, even while they are being punished in its depths. And then he quotes this verse from Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 66, Ya laytana ata'ana Allah wa ata'ana rasul Oh, would that we had obeyed Allah and his Messenger. And then Qadi Iyad, he quotes Qatada, a great exegete who studied under Ibn Abbas, that the Prophet ﷺ said, I was the first of the prophets to be created and the last of them to be sent. And Ibn Kathir and Imam al-Qurtubi, they mentioned this as well in their tafasir. And this is related to the idea that the ruh, the soul of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, has temporal priority over the rest of creation. There's a hadith, it's a popular hadith. <clears throat> it's attributed to the Musannaf of Imam Abdul Razzaq al Sanani. Uh, Imam uh, Yusuf al Nabahani also quotes this hadith. It's a very famous hadith in his famous treatise called Fada'ilu Nabi wa Ummati, the merits of the Prophet and his Ummah. So the hadith says that a companion named Jabir ibn Abdullah came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah bi abi anta wa ummi. And this is how the Sahaba would address the Prophet ﷺ. O Messenger of God, they use a title. Allah uses his title in the Quran, as we mentioned. Allah never calls him directly by his first name. Bi abi anta wa ummi. May my parents be ransomed for you. Akhbirni an awwal shay'in khalaqahu Allah ta'ala qabla al ashya Inform me about the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created before he created anything. Ya Jabir, inna Allah ta'ala khalaqa qabla al-ashya 
نورا نبييكا من نوره O Jabir, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Most High, created before all things the light of your Prophet from his light. This is the hadith. Now, as it turns out, this hadith is actually not found in the Musannaf of Abdul Razak al Sanani. No one could trace it back to anything that's authentically written by him. Most of the ulama today say that this hadith is mawdu'ar, it's fabricated. However, however, many, many ulama, many ulama, great ulama, whether they're scholars of ulum al-Qur'an or their fuqaha or their muhaddithin, many ulama say that the meaning of this hadith is sound. It's still a sound meaning. This particular hadith, however, is fabricated. So it's ja'iz, it's permissible to believe in the meaning of this hadith. That the Prophet وسلم, the light of the Prophet, is the initial creation. It does not make or break your iman. If somebody tells you, you have to believe this, if you don't believe this, this is kufr, say, no, it is not kufr, it's ja'iz. It's, it's non-essential, right? Um, it doesn't make or break your iman. Any questions about that? There are some groups, sometimes they fight over this issue, unfortunately, and they make takfir because of this, this issue. What is the initial light of the Prophet What is the initial creation? There's a stronger hadith that says the pen, the first thing that Allah created, this is a sound hadith, the first thing that Allah created was the pen, the qalam. And Allah said, write, write what? Write, um, write history, write all of history, write existence, right? Now some will try to harmonize these hadith, and they'll say, well, what does the pen made out of? <laughs> uh, the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in its final functioning form is the pen. But what is the constituents of the pen? What is the pen made out of? Light. Light of the Prophet This is how they try to, some of them, they want to harmonize these hadith or these beliefs. Right? Is there, I saw a hand up here. Yes, sir. No, I mean, you're not taking the belief from this hadith. Um, the hadith is fabricated, but so many of the ulama agree in the meaning, with the meaning of the hadith. Let's say there's a hadith that says um, that, that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, created the heavens and the earth in six days. That's a true statement. But let's say you, you try to find this hadith somewhere, you don't find it, or you find that the, the sanad is completely fabricated. So it's a fabricated hadith, but the meaning is sound. So there's other traditions, right? It's not just this one hadith that people are drawing this belief from. There's, there's many, many traditions that, that corroborate this belief. Uh, and, and the fact that many, many great ulama consider this belief jaiz is something to consider. Okay. Any questions over here? Okay. And then you know, there's an, uh, uh, there's Quranic uh, ayat. Remember, we said Allah nuru samawati wal ard, mathalu nurihi. This is an ayah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa taala is the light of the heavens and the earth. Imam Suyuti says the meaning of this is Allah is the source of all light. Mathalu nurihi, the similitude of His light that He owns. This is a different light than the first light. According to many, many commentators, this is a light that he created. And the dominant opinion here is that this second light mentioned here is the Prophet ﷺ. There's many ayat like this. There has come unto you from Allah a light. And they say, well, that's the Qur'an. No, kitab is the light. Kitab is, is the Qur'an. What is the, the nur? And many exegetes say that is the Prophet ﷺ. So this hadith could have been fabricated based on this pre-existing belief that the Prophet ﷺ is light and that he is the first creation. So somebody wrote this hadith. This is one opinion that it's mawdu'ar. Sometimes you get difference of opinion, but this seems to be the dominant opinion. It's called the priority of the Muhammadan light. All right. Moving on then. <clears throat> okay, 
Okay. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so Qadi Iyad now is quoting another ayah. This is 252 of Al-Baqarah. Tilka al-Rusulu faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd wa minhum man kallam Allahu wa rafa'ala wa rafa'a ba'dahum darajat. That uh, we preferred some of the messengers over others. Allah spoke directly to some of them and he raised some of them in rank. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has his prophets at different degrees, at different ranks. We don't give them their ranks. That's what Allah has given them. Some people like to quote the ayah because we say, the Prophet sallallahu is khayr al-khalqillah, he's the best of creation. And then sometimes we get the response. But Allah says, la nufarriqu bayna ahadi min rusuli. Don't make distinctions between prophets. Yes, that's true. I'm not making a distinction between any prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in another ayah, it's important that we read the entire Quran, right? In another ayah, he says that he has his prophets at different darajat, different degrees. So this is an absolutely essential belief. This belief is essential. That the Prophet sallallahu is Sayyidu waladi Adam. He's the master of the children of Adam. This hadith is in Tirmidhi, it's a strong hadith that he's the beloved of God, Habibullah. It's also in, t in Tirmidhi, there might be a slight weakness in this, but this belief is, is, is uh, something that is found um, uh, uh, in many, many uh, uh, scholarly works of, of scholars of hadith and Quran. Imam al-Tahawi, uh, his creed, which is an early creed, which is considered to be an athari creed, in other words, he's, he puts a lot of weight on sound transmissions, Quran and, and strong hadith, also in the ijma' of the salaf. It's a less speculative had, uh, uh, creed, aqidah. Uh, it's more ecumenical, it's, it's safer, if you will. And this is how he describes the Prophet sallallahu He says, Abduhul Mustafa, his chosen servant. Wa nabiyuhul mujtaba, his elected prophet. Wa rasuluhul murtada, his messenger in whom he is well pleased. Khatimul Anbiya, the seal of the prophets. Wa imamul atqiya, the leader of the righteous. Wa sayyidul mursaleen, the master of the messengers of God. Wa habibu rabbil alameen, and the beloved of the Lord of the world. So this is absolutely essential. To say, for example, that that Musa alayhi salam or Isa alayhi salam have the same rank with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, this is highly problematic. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is be the best of creation. These other prophets are obviously great. Um, but the Prophet's maqam as the uh, shafi'r, the shafi'r, the one who intercedes and the one whose intercession is accepted. He has maqam al-Mahmud, he has the station of the Habib. This is without question. Okay. Here Qadi Iyad, he quotes Samarqandi, related that Al-Kalbi said that the words of Allah, وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِعَتِهِ Ibrahim. There's a verse in Surah Safat, verse 83, that says, and from his party, or from his Shia, here Shia, it can mean party or faction, but here it means something more like adherents or followers. And from his followers was Ibrahim. <clears throat> now the question is, who does the pronoun uh, he refer to? And from the followers of him was Ibrahim. Some of the commentators say Nuh alayhi salam, that from the followers of Nuh alayhi salam is Ibrahim. But others said, and this is mentioned by Imam al-Tabari, Imam al-Razi, that the pronoun refers to the Prophet sallallahu That Ibrahim alayhi salam is a follower of the Prophet sallallahu in the sense that the Prophet sallallahu has precedence over him because the Prophet is Imam al-Mursaleen. It just so happens that Ibrahim was sent 
before him in temporality, but in reality, the maqam of the Prophet ﷺ is the highest maqam of all the Prophets. <clears throat> Section 8 here, concerning Allah instructing His creation <coughs> to say the prayer on the Prophet ﷺ, As-salaa ala nabi is protecting him and removing the punishment because of him. Qadi Iyad, he quotes this ayah from Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 33. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah would never punish them while you are among them. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah would never punish them while you are among them. And then he says here, meaning, as long as you are in Mecca, when the Prophet left Mecca and some of the believers were still there, so Imam Tabari and Qurtubi mentioned that some of the Mu'minun, some of the Sahaba, they were convinced by their families not to make hijrah with the Prophet So some of them remained in Mecca. It was difficult for them to leave Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah would never punish them while you are among them. So the Prophet leaves. There's still some believers in Mecca. So then the very next statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish them as long as they're asking for forgiveness. Right? Such is the station of istighfar. That istighfar is the sort of deputy of the Prophet if you will, when he steps away. The Prophet isn't amongst you, then you better make a lot of toba. <laughs> and then the punishment, won't, the adab will not come. This is how to interpret the ayah according to these great mufassirin of the Quran. Is that why you have this statement here? Allah will not punish them while you are among them, and then Allah will not punish them as long as they're making istighfar. Tuba liman wajda fi sahifatihi yom al qiyamati. Istighfaran kathira, the Prophet ﷺ said, O kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam, glad tidings to the one who finds in his sahifa, like his scroll, on the Yom al Qiyamah, a lot of istighfar. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I ask my Lord 70 times a day. And 70 is a, is a sort of figure of speech in Semitic languages. That means a, a lot, not just 70. You count, you know, you, some people count to 70, that's fine. But it means a lot. Now, why is the Prophet ﷺ? who is ma'asum, making istighfar. He can't, he can't deliberately disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would make his istighfar after the prayer. Right? So, one of the reasons, the reason why he's making istighfar is because that he failed to praise Allah as Allah praises himself. And he was overheard saying this in sajda by Aisha. Subhanaka la, uh, la uthni alayk uh, anta kama athnayta ala nafsik that glory be to you, how can I praise you as you have praised yourself? This is why he's making istighfar. Why do we make istighfar? For different reasons. <laughs> For that reason also. But many, many other different reasons. So this is the reason why he's been, also to teach us. The Prophet is a mu'allim. So he's teaching us how, what is proper adab, what is good ubudiyah. Ubudiyah means like, like slavehood, but it really has to do with like character, adab with Allah, good adab with Allah. Right? So he says, <clears throat> and then he quotes this verse. He, he moves around here. He goes to Surah 48, Al Fatih, verse 25. And this verse needs some uh, context, but he quotes it here. Had they been clearly distinguished, then we would have punished the unbelievers among them with a painful punishment. He says in the same ayah, if it, had, uh, if it had not been for certain men and women believers whom you did not know. So the context of this verse, verse 25 of Surah Fatih, verse 48, according to Qurtubi and Tabari and Al-Wahidi, is that when the Prophet ﷺ was at Hudaybiyah with the Sahaba, 30 of the Mushrikeen attempted to surprise attack them and kill them and they were caught by the Prophet 
but he released them. So this was obviously reason enough for the Muslims to attack the city militarily. Apparently some of the Muslims wanted to attack. I mean, they tried to massacre the Muslims. But Allah says here, if the Muslims from Medina had retaliated, then they would have accidentally killed some of the believers in Mecca, people they didn't even know were believers because they never met them. The dawah continues in Mecca. While the Prophet is in Medina for years, people are still making shahada in Mecca because there's still Sahaba living in Mecca. Right? And many of them were hiding their faith because it was dangerous uh, to come out uh, and say I'm Muslim in public. You could be tortured and killed and uh, uh, you know, um, cut off from your family and these types of things. So it was a bit dangerous. When the believers immigrated, it was revealed, وَمَا لَهُمْ يُعَذِّبُهُمُ اللَّهُ But what can you, but what do you have now that Allah should not punish you? So Qadi Iyad, he says here, these ayat pre present one of the clearest demonstrations of the Prophet's exalted position. The punishment was averted from the people of Mecca firstly because of his presence, and then because of the presence of Sahaba after him, making istighfar, when none of the Sahaba were left in Mecca, eventually they all made hijrah, Allah punished the Meccans by giving the believers power and victory over them. He made their swords rule over them, and the Muslims inherited their land, their homes, and their property. So this is a reference now to the bloodless uh, conquest of Mecca in 8 Hijri. <clears throat> and he says here, Allah punished them, but the Prophet and it's true as a form of punishment, but, but the Prophet ﷺ really honored the Meccans, even while taking their city. I mean, he's well within his rights to just take everyone out, all the men. And that's an accepted war practice. No one would have faulted him for that. You know, when he was coming into the city, a companion named Sa'd ibn Ubadah, who had a lot of zeal, he's holding the standard of the Muslims. And he was shouting at the Meccans, Al-Yawma Yawmul Malhama. Uh, today is the day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. Right? And he was shouting this over and over again. <clears throat> Abu Sufyan had already converted, but this was his people. He was a leader of the Meccans, so he was, he was afraid what's going to happen here. Here comes his, you know, these Muslims coming into the city. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ heard that this is what Sa'ad was saying. Somebody told him, relayed the message to him. And he said, go tell them not to say that and take the standard from him so that everyone knows that I don't agree with this statement. So they go to Sa'ad and they say, give us a standard. And he said, why? And he said, this is, the Prophet is saying, he said, I don't believe you. What do you mean give, give up the standard? So they went back to the Prophet wasallam. He said, he's not giving it up. And the Prophet took his blessed imama off. He said, present this to Sa'ad and take the standard from him. But give the standard to his son, Qais. This is for the wisdom of the Prophet because he knew it would be hurtful, right, to be you know, disciplined in a sense by the Prophet But by giving the standard to his Sa'ad's son, he's still honoring Sa'ad. It's still his son. So then the Prophet he passes by Abu Sufyan and he says, Al yawma yawmul marhama uh, Qurayshan. Today is a day, just slightly altered the statement of Sa'ad. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. The exaltation of the Quraysh. Man dakhala beta Abi Sufyan faqad amin. And he said his name. He said, whoever enters into the house or under the protection of Abu Sufyan, that person is safe. This was their recognized leader. Right? Notice he didn't say, whoever enters into my house or the house of Omar or Abu Bakr or some. No, your leader is Abu Sufyan. If he gives you protection, you're, you're, you're fine. This is how, you know, he says here that Allah punished the Meccans. It is a form of punishment because the Prophet is now taking the city. But in reality, right, it's a sign of, of, of Izzah for the Quraysh. <coughs> Any questions on that? <coughs> Some of these uh, Christian polemicists, they write things like, 
that they say that they insult the Prophet or they critique him and say that because the Prophet engaged in military actions, he can't be a true prophet, which is completely ridiculous. Because according to their own book, in Exodus 33, when according to their book, when Musa descended the mountain and he saw people worshiping the calf, he ordered the, the Levites to slaughter 3,000 men in one day. He actually says, go kill your neighbor your brother, your family member. If you look at all of the Ghazawat of the Prophet all of his military expeditions, there were 1,018 deaths, according to Abu Hassan al nadawi In 23 years, 700 mushrikeen and about 400 Sahaba. And these are all on the battlefield. These are all warriors on the battlefield. There are no innocent civilians being targeted here. Right? 1,018 in 23 years. And most of the time when the Prophet would go out for a military expedition, the enemy would see him and run away because Allah would put terror into their hearts. Ru'ab right? fi By 1018, 3,000 men are killed by Musa salam in the Torah, according to the Torah, 3,000 men fell in one day, but he's a true prophet. But the Prophet is, is, not, is not a prophet because he engaged in military. <laughs> it's total hypocrisy. It's a double standard. Or you say he, he had uh, he, polygamous relationships. He had more than one wife. Okay. Bani Israel. Who is Israel? Yaqub. He has 12 sons from four different women. Two of them were concubines. Are those legitimate children? Isa is a descendant of one of these women. Is he legitimate? They're God. Isa alayhi salam. Total double standard. It's quite ridiculous. Yes. One person, Naam. Naam, Ubay bin Khalaf. Ubay bin Khalaf, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, he passed by Ubay bin Khalaf, <clears throat> and he was like brushing his horse. And so he looked at the Prophet and he said, you know why I'm doing this for my horse? Why? And he said, I'm going to use this horse one day and kill you while I'm riding it. And the Prophet said, perhaps I'll kill you. <laughs> this was, you know, so at Ghazwat Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ was struck on the side of his face by a man named Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, a mushrik. He struck him on the side of the face, and, uh, and some of the chain mail had penetrated into the cheek, right? So he pulled it out, and there was blood flowing down his face. And then he noticed that uh, Ubay bin Khalaf is charging towards him. So the, the Sira says the Prophet grabbed a, spe a spear and like shook off like 10 men off of him. So he shook them off like they were flies. And then he barely tapped him on the neck right here. He's like a, like a tap. Right? Because the point isn't to, the intention is important. So he just tapped him on the neck, and then, and then Ubay bin Khalaf, he went back to the, the, the mushrikeen, and he said, he's killed me, he's killed me, he's killed me. And they said, what's wrong? And he said, look, and he said, this is just a scratch. And he said, no, he's, he told me he was going to kill me. And then... Um, there's a report that says that he, he, got, he went insane and his, his horse jumped off the cliff. Another report that says it festered and it and, uh, you know, got infected and he died from that. But this was the only man, yeah. Obey bin Khalaf. That guy was a big shaitan. Yeah. He's from the Mustahzi'un. Remember we talked about the Mustahzi'un? These are the worst type of kuffar who mock and ridicule the Prophet they don't just disbelieve in him, they mock and ridicule him. Yeah. So they'll say something like, oh, this, he killed a man, therefore he can't. This isn't a battlefield. There's a prophet in the Old Testament, I mentioned this a lot, his name is Elisha. This is a prophet that Christians believe is a prophet, Elisha. Is he mentioned in the Quran? Probably not. Allahu alam. Maybe al yasa but I, I, don't, I don't know. But Elisha is a prophet in the Old Testament. This is what he did. He's walking down the street, and some, some kids begin following him. Small boys, it says. And they start making fun of his bald spot. This is a story in the Bible. They start making fun of his bald spot. Uh, and then this prophet gets so offended that he prays to the Lord. And these two bears come out of the wilderness, and they rip apart 42 young boys. 
this person is a prophet according to the Christians and Jews. But the Prophet on the field of battle, tapping a man on the neck, and that man dying on the field of battle, defending his city, oh, he's not a prophet because he killed someone on, on the battlefield. <laughs> Double standard. Prophets have to defend their cities. Anyway, these are things that they don't teach you in Sunday school. <laughs> Even in seminary, they don't teach you these things. I mean, I, I attended basically a Christian seminary. I have a master's in biblical studies, so I, I took all these classes in the Bible. They don't teach these things. You'll get some other stuff. These are things you have to get by personal study. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> See we're doing on time here. There was a question from last week, inshallah. I'll, I'll, um, I have to look at the source of it. It's about the ru'ya and a statement of our mother Aisha. I'll give the answer next week, inshallah. The ayah, he says here, Qadiriya, continuing, uh, is interpreted by Abu Musa, I'm, um, I'm guessing Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah sent down on me two sureties for my ummah. Sureties like a guarantee. Two guarantees. What's the first guarantee? Allah would not punish the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ while he is among them. The second guarantee, Allah would not punish them as long as they're asking for forgiveness. And he says this harks back to the words of Allah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Where is this again? Where is this verse? Oh man. Good. Al Anbiya. Verse 107. 21107. 21107. Burn it into your brain. 21107. The Prophet said, I am a surety for my companions. This is a hadith in Muslim. Some say that this means against innovations, like bid'ah. Others say it means against like disagreement and disorder. One of the men of knowledge say, this is what Qadi Iyad is saying, one of the men of knowledge say, the messenger was the greatest surety while he was alive, and he's present as long as his sunnah is present. When his sunnah dies out, then expect, then expect musibah and fitna, affliction and disorder. What is the sunnah? The authenticated, normative ethos and practice of the Prophet ﷺ. The agreed upon prophetic precedent. Sunnah does not mean hadith. Sunnah is drawn from hadith. But there's different grades of hadith. The sunnah is the authenticated ethos of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is, according to Qadi Iyad, this is, seems to be his, the final thing he says on this ayah. That when it says, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah will not punish them as long as you are among them or in them, meaning the sunnah is within us. As long as the sunnah is within us, it is as if the Prophet ﷺ is among us. إِنَّ الدِّينَ بَدَأَ غَرِبًا فَسَيْعُدُ كَمَا بَدَأَ We know this hadith. That's the first part of the hadith that we hear quoted all the time. Verily this religion began as something strange. And it's going to become strange again. Fatuba lil huraba, glad tidings to the strangers. And then he describes the strangers. Who are the strangers? Those who set aright or correct what humanity corrupted after me from my sunnah. There are a lot of people today that are doing things and saying, I found this in hadith, this is Quran, this is sunnah, this is that sunnah. So alaykum bi sunnati. This is a way of, of really, in Arabic, really emphasizing. Alaykum bi sunnati. I exhort you to follow my sunnah. Wa sunnatil khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin. And the rightly guided caliphs. The sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. And then, so who are the rightly guided caliphs? There are actually five of them. Imam Suyuti says five of them. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, Sayyidina Umar, Uthman Ali, and Imam Hassan 
was a caliph for six months, which makes 30 years, according to the hadith, before he abdicated to uh, Muawiyah. <clears throat> so follow the sunnah, my sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. And then he says, Tamasaku biha wa addu alayha bin nawajiv. Very sort of dramatic. Like hold on to it with every ounce of your being and bite into it with your molar teeth. That's how hard you should hold on to the, to the sunnah. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi, let me, let me not find one of you reclining on his couch when a command I ordered or a prohibition from me comes to him and he says, La adri, I don't know. Ma wajadna fi kitab ittaba'nahu. I don't know. Whatever we, whatever we find in the book of God, that's what we follow. I don't know about the sunnah. I don't know. I don't know. He said, let me not find one of you say that. So he said, oh, what is the sunnah? Who knows who wrote the sunnah? Who knows? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that the sunnah is going to be preserved. If we believe in the Quran. Because Allah says, follow the messenger. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Why would Allah say that? Follow the messenger is a beautiful example if we can't get to the real sunnah. How do you know what sunnah is? This is my, my uncle says this, my cousin says that. Well, you have to sit with ulama and discover the true sunnah because it's something real. A lot of people claim to know sunnah, to have the sunnah, but it's important for us to be with the majority. Right? Yadullahi fawqa, yadullahi ma'al jama'ah is the hadith. That the, and here the ulama make ta'wil and they say that yad, yadullah means the protection of God is with the majority. Right? Stick with the majority. <clears throat> All right. So then he quotes this ayah, this famous ayah, which you should also know, 3356. Inna allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu, sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Allah and his angels, uh, he says, pr pray blessing on the Prophet. O oh, believers, pray, pray blessing on him and pray for peace on him. So Qadi Iyad, he says here, the prayer of the angels and humanity is supplication, is a dua for the Prophet. We're supplicating for the Prophet Ultimately, the supplication is for our own benefit. Our du'a does not benefit the Prophet It's for our own benefit, ultimately. And he says this explicitly in a hadith. Man salla alayya wahida, sallallahu alayhi ashara. Whoever sends benedictions of peace upon me, as ala nabi, one time, Allah sends blessings of peace upon that person ten times. But then what does it mean? Inna Allaha yusalli ala nabi. What does it mean that Allah prays upon the Prophet or eulogizes the Prophet or sends blessings of peace upon the Prophet? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving him additional mercy. So when we do it, it's supplication. That really benefits us. When Allah does it, it's additional mercy to the Prophet sallallahu which again benefits us because that, that affects the ummah, the state of the ummah. One of the commentators said that the interpretation of the letters, Kaf ha ya ain sad. This is the first ayah of Surat Maryam. This is from those huruf al muqatta'at, um, these disjointed letters that uh, nobody really knows what they mean. But alas, many of the ulama have their opinions. Wallahu alam. So Qadi Iyati mentions that one of them said, Kaf refers to. Allah being enough, kifaya, for the Prophet. And then he quotes the ayah, alayhi sallahu bi kafin abda, is not Allah enough for his slave? The ha refers to his guidance, hidaya, as in the words, uh, yahdika, yahdiyaka Allah, yahdiyaka sirata mustaqima. Yahdiyaka, yeah, it's a, uh, 
Surah Fat, verse number two. He will guide you to a straight path. Uh -huh. The Ya refers to support. Wa'ayyadakum binasrihi. Ayyada. The Ya here is a the sort of prominent letter. He will support you with help. The Ain refers to Isma. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah will protect you from people. And the sod refers to salah. In the Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi. So kafa ya ain sod. Allahu alam. Allah says if you support one another against him, Allah is his mawla in Jibreel and the right acting believers. Mawla here means protector. The right acting believers, salihul mu'minin, are said to be the prophets. It is also said that it should be taken literally as meaning all the believers. Any questions about that's the end of section eight. Section nine, Qadi Iyad, he quotes the first ten verses of Surah Al Fatih. This is Surah 48. So I'll just quote some of it here. Allah says, We have given you a clear victory. Fatha Mubina. That Allah may forgive you your former and latter wrong actions and complete his blessing upon you and guide you to the straight path. And that Allah might help you with a mighty victory. It is he who sent down the Sakina into the hearts of the believers, that they might add belief to their belief. To Allah belong the legions of the heavens and the earth. Allah is knowing and wise. And that he might admit the believing men and women into gardens underneath which rivers flow, remaining there forever, and acquit them of their evil deeds. That is a mighty victory with Allah. And that he might punish the men and women hypocrites, the men and women idolaters, and those who think badly of Allah, an evil turn of fortune against them. Allah is angry with them and has cursed them and prepared Jahannam for them, an evil return. To Allah belong the legions of the heavens and the earth. Allah is mighty wise. Indeed, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of glad news, and a warner, so that you, the people, will believe in Allah and his messenger and help him and respect him and glorify his praise morning and evening. Those who pledge allegiance to you actually pledge allegiance to Allah. Yadullahi fawqa aidihim. Allah's hand is over their hands. So <clears throat> he has a long commentary here, commentary here. But he says here, when Allah says, وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتُهُ عَلَيْكَ And complete his blessing upon you. It is said that this is by abasing those who show arrogance towards the Prophet وسلم, And it is said that he means the conquest of Mecca and Ta'if. It is said that he means by elevating your renown in this world, helping you and forgiving you. Allah is telling him that the completion of his blessing upon him lies in the abasement of his haughty enemies, opening up the most important and best beloved of towns, elevating his renown and guiding him to the straight path, which leads to the garden. And then he says, Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadiran. So these are again ism nakira. These are all indefinite nouns. I talked about the sort of rhetorical import of that uh, first week. Indeed, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of, of good news, and as a warner. He says, Allah enumerates some of the Prophet's good qualities and special characteristics. And then he says, help him and respect him. It is said that they, it is said that they will go to great lengths to esteem him. The most common and clear statement about this is that it refers to the Prophet They help and respect the Prophet. And then right after that it says, وَأَسِيلًا And they glorify his praise morning and evening, referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Atta, he said, this surah contains various blessings for the Prophet. The clear victory, which is a sign of being answered. Forgiveness, which is a sign of love. Completed blessing, which is a sign of election, and guidance, which is a sign of wilaya, of friendship, forgiveness consistent in being freed from faults, 
The completed blessing is to attain to the degree of perfection. Guidance is a summons to witnessing. Ja'far ibn Muhammad said, part of his completed blessing to him is that he made him his beloved. So there's a verse in the Quran, Ayatul Imtihan, Qul in kuntum tuhibbuna Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhbibkum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Say, if you really love Allah, follow me. Then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. So the ulama say by following, if by following the Prophet Sallallahu anyone can become beloved of Allah, then how much does Allah love the Prophet Sallallahu If anyone can be beloved by just following the Prophet, how much does Allah love the Prophet? <clears throat> and he says, swore by his life, remember, la amruka, abrogated other sharia by him, raised him to the highest place, protected him in the mi'raj, so that his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside, ma al basaru wa ma sent him to all mankind, made uh, uh, war booty lawful for his community. He also made him an accepted intercessor and master of descendants of Adam. He coupled this, he coupled his name with his name, and his pleasure with his pleasure. He made him one of the two pillars of Tawheed. This is all the commentary of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Ja'far al-Sadiq of Surah Al-Fatih. Allah then says, those who pledge allegiance to you, those who make bay'ah to you, actually pledge allegiance to Allah. The tafsir says, this is a reference to what's known as the bay'atul ridwan at Hudaybiyah. They pledge allegiance to Allah when they pledge allegiance to you. So at Hudaybiyah, the Prophet wasallam, he sent Sayyidina Uthman to negotiate with the Meccans. Then he received a false report that Uthman had been killed. So he sat under a tree and took pledges of allegiance from the companions. Ibn Kathir and Qurtubi say the pledge was that they would fight with the Prophet until death. We'll end here, inshallah.